everybody, so glad to be here. My name's Gabe Zickerman, and uh, my subject today is um, addiction. But first, I want to start off with the story of Ulysses. Now, Ulysses was the first stud in our history. He was Greece's Chris Pine, Chris Hemsworth, and Chris Pratt rolled into one guy. <laughs> is there anything that Chris's can't do? I don't know. We'll talk about that. Um, but so Ulysses, there was one thing that Ulysses felt he couldn't do, which was listen to the sound of the sirens of the sea. The sirens were this uh, mermaids who were dangerous and, and their songs were said to make people crazy. So what did he do? He had himself tied to the mast of a ship and then uh, asked his men to put uh, their uh, ears and fill them with wax and then w ride directly to the sirens, right? Directly to sirens. And he told them under penalty of death, they were not to allow him to be let go from the ship. Under no circumstances should they allow it. Now, Many of us, I'm sure all of us, can relate to the idea in our lives of being um, in a situation where we feel like it's not how we would be in our, our sober self. So like wanting something when we're sober and then being different when we get in a situation that's particularly exciting. And probably the, um, the one idea that most exemplifies this, um, I think, is addiction. And you might be surprised, of course, that addiction... Uh, has been with us since the beginning of time. It comes in all these cultures. But you may also be surprised at how serious of a problem it is today. Uh, the WHO estimates that over 800 million people are alcoholics around the world. 800 million people. And if we take a step back from this, we zoom out from this, and we add other things to this list, technology-mediated addictions, screen time, gambling, shopping, pornography, the numbers get exponentially larger. And if we zoom out one more time, and we let go of this definition of addiction, which is that people have to reach rock bottom. It's like a very a vestigial idea of a scarce treatment modality. And we think about overuse, people doing something more than they would like, the binge drinker rather than the alcoholic. The numbers get even bigger. And so I wondered, why is it that it's been so difficult to conquer addiction since it's been around for so long. And my research led me to a quick acronym, BEST, and it stands for Bias, Economy, Stigma, and Technology, and I wanna talk about these things. So first, technology. We've always used technology to make things more addictive. It's how we make pot stronger, a weed, an acre of weed more potent. It's how we make fentanyl more deadly. Technology has always been part of addiction. But what's different today is that technology is now the end addiction in and of itself, right? So minor footnotes in psychology like porn addiction didn't exist basically 20 years ago. And today they're a thing that affects tens of millions of people. When it comes to stigma, you know, we tend to think of addicts as the other. It's uh, poor people, people with mental illness, people who live on the street. But in fact, science today tells us that addiction is connected to our dopamine loop in our brain. So every time we challenge ourselves to something and we achieve it, our brain secretes a little bit of dopamine. And that makes us want to do that thing again. This is how we got to the moon. This is how we build great things. This is why you eat. This is why you procreate. This dopaminergic loop. But it's hijacked in addiction. It makes you want to do that thing more and more and more. And so addiction is not something that other people face. You are born an addict. Your evolutionary biology is designed to make you addicted to those things that will keep you alive and move your family lineage forward. It's almost like everyone's an addict. And the economy, of course, capitalism, has found a way to really uh, leverage that idea and drive it deeply. Uh, this is a KFC double down. It's a crazy sandwich. Um, <laughs> the, the, the bread is actually made of chicken. Um, and so KFC, like most other uh, food companies, employs tens of thousands of people whose sole job it is to make the stuff they eat more addictive. If it were up to them, you would eat every single meal at KFC, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks in between. And you know what? It's not just the food business. Literally every company on earth would like for you to use their product and service to the exclusion of everything else. You know, people talk about our economy as being driven by information or being driven by attention, but I actually think no matter how we look at it, we live in an addiction economy. Now, what's happened that's made this more extreme is the advent of algorithms. So 
maybe you, like companies like Facebook and Google who use algorithms to get you kind of addicted to their products and refreshing, you know, maybe you could learn willpower to resist the KFC double down, but these algorithms are designed to actually take your willpower and use it against you. They learn how you resist them, and they come up with alternatives to overcome your willpower. And I know this, you guys, because I've spent the better part of the last 10 years being a staunch advocate for gamification. I've worked with many of these companies on making their systems more addictive and engaging. And it's become very clear to me that things have gone a little too far. <laughs> and the last element in this discussion is about bias. Everybody is sure they know why addiction exists. Oh, it's trauma. Oh, it's like if we were just more social and connected and we all got to hang out, there would be no addicts. And everybody has an idea about how to treat it, right? There, it's a moral failing. It requires religion. It requires total abstinence. Just say no, which is probably the worst one of all of these. And the truth is, there's no one ring to rule addiction. Addiction is not one thing. In fact, the word tells us very clearly. So here's an image of uh, Rob Ford, Toronto's famous crack-smoking mayor. <laughs> it is my hometown. Go the six. Okay, so... <laughs> Toronto's, and, and by the way, if you're from Washington or various other cities, you can replace this with your own cracked out mayor. Uh, you don't have to use Rob Ford. So we see Rob Ford on one side of this image, and on the other side of this image, you see two people who obviously have an issue with their phones. Now, here's the thing. Every rational person looks at this image and understands that there are some similarities, but that they are not the same. And you see how brute force our idea is about this concept that we use the same term to describe both of them. And so, given all of these things, let me tell you something. Addiction treatments are really poor. Now, I pulled together, this is hard to get data, I pulled together the best, most optimistic meta-analysis of treatment efficacy across various modalities. And the best that we've got to treat addiction has a 30% success rate at one year. Three zero percent. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, that's great, that's awesome. Uh, lung cancer has a 52% five-year survival rate right now. If we use 30% as our benchmark, it's no wonder that we don't move things forward. It's like, we don't ever get to that level. And it's not much better than willpower, by the way, which comes in at 22%. And so I think we need to think about this completely differently. Right now, we think of addiction as like trauma, right? Mobilize the forces, everyone in the emergency room, spend $25,000 a month on rehab. And what we need to do is start thinking of it as preventative medicine. Because you see, if you successfully vaccinate everyone, despite what Gwyneth Paltrow or whatever tells you, if you successfully vaccinate everyone, I guess Jenny McCarthy, sorry Gwyneth, sorry. Um, <laughs> gloop, gloop. Um, if you successfully vaccinate everybody, right, you don't need trauma medicine. And that that was the heart of an idea that we had two years ago. I got together with my friend Adam Singer, um, both of us have family and friend histories of addiction, uh, assembled an amazing, diverse team, brought in uh, great advisors from UCLA, Stanford, and Columbia, and said, can we do this thing differently? Can we change the way that this works? And so we identified four things that really matter. A solution to addiction has to be passive, personalized, predictive, and priced well. And passive means it has to report on you automatically. People are very bad at self-reporting. <laughs> Personalized means that the solution has to be tailored to you individually. Some people want to quit, some people want to reduce, some people want to do things at different times. There's no one way of solving this. And now I want to dig in a little bit more on pricing and prediction. Uh, before we do that, though, let me just tell you briefly what we built. So Onward is the name of the company, and the way the product works is you install it on your devices, it tracks your behavior, and then produces a report of your unwanted behaviors. Then we attempt to predict when you're gonna act out and serve you up a just-in-time clinically validated intervention before you do, okay? And those interventions can include uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, physical activity, mindfulness, all the different kinds of things, and everything is optimized using machine learning so that we get to like, you know, the optimal solution for each individual person. Um, so the pricing element of it is really important, you guys. Let me break this down for you, I'm sure you know. Uh, we do a really crappy job of dealing with mental health in this country. Like, really bad. Now, if we actually decided to get our act together and solve the mental health crisis in the United States, and abroad, by the way, mental health, behavioral health, would be the single biggest outlay in our healthcare system. 
by a country mile. It would eat the entire budget that we currently have, and then some. Because I'll tell you what, $100 an hour therapy visits for every person doesn't scale. $25,000 a month rehab for people does not scale. So a solution in this space, if we want to really reach everybody, it has to be dollars per user per month and not hundreds of dollars per user per hour. Now, Many people believe, and it probably makes total sense as it relates to prediction, that how you feel, your mood, will likely predict whether or not you're going to act out. This is a very commonly understood heuristic. For the first time in our research, we were able to demonstrate unequivocally with observable empirical data that in fact this is true. So we did a study with 1,500 self-described porn addicts and we were able to look at their actual behavior and what happened, and what we found was that those who said they were anxious were two and a half times more likely to act out in the subsequent three hours. And those who said they were happy were much less likely to act out. And so we can see the evidence of this for the first time. Now, why is this important? Okay, this is a Skinner box up on the board. Many of you know these experiments from Skinner. Rat presses a pedal, food comes out. The main lesson there for us that's important is the idea that action and reaction have to be closely tied together. An event and the response have to be close. You don't need to be a research psychologist to know this if any of you have kids or a dog or even a spouse. Um, <laughs> you know that you can't be like, honey, you know what you did last week? I'm really angry with you, right? That doesn't work. The interval has to be really close together. But it might surprise you to know just how close. This is a chart of the firing of a neuron in a person's brain. It happens to be a coke addict looking at an image of cocaine. And what you can see in the firing of this neuron in this ERP is that at 50 milliseconds a neuron fires, five zero milliseconds, that is a really short period of time. And by the time that neuron fires, you guys, it's too late to stop that person. It's too late. It's like when the person has the drink in their hand is the wrong time to try to persuade them to put the drink down. This is a very, very small amount of time. And so it's no wonder that all of those things I showed you up on the board just fail, right? They're kind of ridiculous, the way that we treat behavior change. We ask people to be conscious of their emotional state at any one time, which people are really bad at, okay, like really bad. Like, are you hungry, are you thirsty, are you horny? Like, you have no idea. And if you had like 10 minutes just to sit down and like think about it, you'd probably figure it out, right? But you're going about your day. Okay, so first you have to be conscious of how you feel. Then you have to preempt your trigger response. So 50 milliseconds or less, you've got to, oh shit, I saw cocaine. Arr! Okay, so you've got to preempt that. It's really hard, really hard. You have to replace this behavior with a new behavior, right? So instead of snorting the cocaine, you've got to like uh, go out for a jog. <laughs> and, and then you have to do this thing uh, only at three to seven day reinforcement intervals, right? You only see the therapist once a week and then you have to say, oh, this is what happened last week during the therapy. So it's no wonder this is just such a setup for fail. So we said, okay, can we build behavioral prediction using the phone? Started off with, you know, your usage data, but imagine over time that you're able to like incorporate all these different sensors that can get at your state of mind and what's going on, how anxious you are, how tired you are, how well you slept, all this stuff is in your phone. Okay, so can we take that data and actually predict whether or not people are going to act out? And it turns out we can. With 79% accuracy better than chance, we're able to predict in this research study whether or not somebody would act out in a three-hour window. This is the beginnings of proof that machines can know us better than we know ourselves. And that that connection is very important because of the need to preempt this behavior. If we're successful with prediction, we can actually stop people from acting out. So in this research study, we were able to stop two-thirds of people who were triggered actually from acting out as a result of getting out in front of this particular behavior. And at a high level, zooming out again, in our studies, we were able to get 89% of people to reduce their usage and 51% of people to quit completely. Thank you. Thank you. I wanna, I of course wanna caution, it's early days, but what an exciting moment for all of us. Back to, Chris Pratt, he's my favorite. Okay, so back, back to Ulysses. Um, the idea of making a commitment with yourself from when you are sober or clear of mind to when you are in the throes of something, a, a trigger, a passion, whatever, that concept in psychology is actually called a Ulysses Pact after this particular uh, myth. And it's used in many different areas of psychology, but we've come to an interesting new moment where if you don't have an army of people to lash you to a post, and you don't have people in your life who can figure you out 
Software can do that for you. You can make a contract with yourself when you're of clear mind and have that enforced by intelligent, artificially intelligent, data-driven, predictive software. It is uh, an astonishing moment. We are uh, on the cusp of curing addiction. I know we are. I'm, I'm really confident about it. But also, we're at an interesting moment overall because I think one of the things that, that our research at Onward shows is that we actually can equip you with the tools necessary to live your best life. So we can give you and you can have an algorithm that is designed to protect you against the algorithms of every company and organization and government that is attempting to influence your behavior. You can have your own army of people sitting in your phone helping you get what it is that you want out of life. And if we can do this, right, what we're talking about is we're talking about finally giving people control over their behavior, not in an abstract way, not in a like, will you just behave kind of way, right? Um, famously, no one who is ever told to calm down actually calms down, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so um, uh, and my boyfriend always says that whenever I tell him to calm down, um, <laughs> universal. So, uh, so we know that this has got to be a different situation, and we know that we are on the cusp, I believe, that we are on the cusp of giving people true control over their own behavior, giving them the tools to unlock the way they want to be, regardless of the context, regardless of who's trying to you know, influence you or get what you want. It is uh, the unleashing of limitless human potential, and the future just feels upward and onward. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>